Adam, what's up, brother? So great to see you. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. It is wonderful to talk to you. I know we've been floating around the same circles online for about four years now, but this is our first direct conversation, which is pretty cool. I'm actually really impressed with what you've done because I see a lot of uh, professionals, whether it's in the medical field or uh, therapy, which is your, your background and profession or financial services. And there's a lot of really talented individuals out there who know their fields really well, but they don't market very well. And that's one thing that you do exceptionally good. And I think that really resonates with people in a way that probably a lot of therapists don't. I, I'm wondering what you attribute some of that success to. Men, um, my fellow men. So I paired up very well with some good men who knew marketing and understood how to make that work. I brought my professional knowledge. I connected to these men. They're like brothers to me now. They're, they're with Veritas Agency. And they we, together, we built that. That's how men are supposed to function is one of us is strong here. One is strong here. You march forward together. So that's, I would say that they've taught me a tremendous amount. I, I agree as far as men banding together and working together, but it seems like in the modern era that we live, that is an increasing rarity. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. So most men are not raised to understand that they can connect with other men. We're raised by women and we're raised to be fairly docile, fairly calm, keep everything under the level. And we don't have the direct communication that we need with other men. We don't understand that the male brains throughout history have been this male solution network, all these data nodes, solving problems, working together. They're meant to link up in this vast web that not only transcends time and space, space, but, but connects every man who's ever lived so that we can share things like the wheel and fire and pointy sticks without men having to recreate that. We are bringing that back now. I think that the internet is helping bring that back. Men like you with, with, with your order of man and, and the, the grouping that you've done with men and, and the work that I've done reconnecting men, I think we're bringing that back. But the male solution network that we have building, that is absolutely vital. We've got to bring that back. Yeah, I've never heard it referred to the male solution network, but as I think about that terminology, that's really powerful. And mm -hmm. and the the reason I think I like it and I imagine that it mm -hmm. resonates with other men when talking about relationship building, I mean even think about that term. Like that doesn't totally sound comfortable for me or men. Relationship building. Mm -hmm. But male solution can, network to me sounds more action oriented, more driven towards results as opposed yes. to purely the relational element, which I think would be characterized as more feminine than masculine. Yes. If we take relationship building and replace it with solution network forging, then men love it. And it's exactly the same thing. It involves the same conversations, the same high fives, everything. But you are forging a network that brings you solutions where you share solutions across that network. So one man benefits from the work everybody else is doing. What do you think in your experience are the common objections you hear to this? Obviously there's time constraints, there's energy constraints, and then there's just the ego, I think that gets in the way as well. Well, I mean, yeah, look, I, I work 12 to 14 hours a day, usually five days a week, or lately it's been six or seven because it's the holidays. And I've got four kids. I've got baby number five on the way next month. Uh, I got a stay at home wife. I thank you. I, I, I take care of my wife. I also spend time with friends. I make time for the men in my network. I have scheduled meetings with my friends every single week. I build it in. It is non-negotiable for me. That's how it must be. If a man wants to advance, he must have non-negotiable time where he networks and connects with other men. Otherwise you're alone out here. And all you can do is build solutions that you can think of. That's not going to take you real far. You're going to get stuck eventually. So number one, there's that. Number two is Again, we are raised in this world where men are not encouraged to bond with other men. We need we need to be initiated into male bonding. There's a special hormone called vasopressin that men have more receptors of than women do. And it, it, it bonds us together when we solve challenges together, when we overcome stress together. It actually cements a bond between you and the other person that says this person is a valuable ally. Keep them around prioritize them. Now you need to be initiated into that bonding with fathers, uncles, cousins, brothers, grandfathers. Men need to teach you that and initiate you into that kind of solution focused bonding. But what's happening instead is that men are having broken connections. When they're children, they learn they have to be interesting instead of being who they are. They have to be docile instead of being direct. They have to be easy to be around instead of being a man or being masculine or even pursuing solutions. We have to pursue feelings instead of solutions. We prioritize feelings. That does not 
help us to bond with other men either. And it creates insecure attachment. When you have insecure attachment, it's very hard to bond with other men. That's why men who have insecure attachment, whether they're anxious about it and self-hating, or they are fearful of other people and keep them at arm's length, either one is very hard to bond with other men and build that network. Yeah, I'm really interested in the attachment styles. I, I've, I've done a little bit of, of mm -hmm. study, obviously not to the degree that you have on attachment. Mm -hmm. And I would think that I, I, I strive to be more secure in my attachment styles, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. by default, I tend to be more of an anxious attachment type person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you find that to be based, and I know this is a broad generality, but do you find that to be based on gender or is that upbringing? Is that nature versus nurture? What does that look like? It's two things, two things. So number one, um, the, the most common attachment issue that we we know of in men is nice guy syndrome, and that's anxious mm -hmm. attachment. It's the belief there's something wrong with me on the inside. Everyone else can see it. I'm an imposter. I'm a fraud. No one will ever accept me if they see this. So I have to try to uh, accommodate for it and and make up for it and, and, and be this big man. But if anyone ever sees who I really am, they'll see that I'm worthless on the inside. That's, that's more anxious attachment. And we carry that into our connections. We're always trying to earn approval so people People won't abandon us or and we won't be exposed the, the and that's that's actually not the most common attachment style for men the most common attachment style for men more than women is avoidant attachment which mm. is the belief that there's something wrong with other people either they are on incapable of love or they're just not able to handle stress or or there's something off about other people but they will never be fair with you they will always play against you when the stress hits they will take what they can get and leave you in the lurch you cannot trust other people so you have to avoid conflict keep them at arm's length so you can get away avoid conflict stay back and avoid that entanglement solve problems alone everything has to be done alone and you have to be a lone wolf these guys are incredible at business they are great executives they rise right to the top they have no relationship drama and they can schmooze like nobody else and they also usually have plenty of girlfriends going on but they never have deep connections and eventually their wife says i can't handle you anymore I'm done. I am taking the kids and I'm out. And he's like, what the hell? I've, I've done everything for you on paper, but there's been no emotional connection between us for 20 years. Right. Hmm. So those are the two main attachment styles that I tend to see the guys in the first camp. They know something's wrong and they're grateful to hear about attachment theory and they want to fix it because they, they it's like, oh, thank God, maybe I'm not the problem. Guys in the second camp say, Adam, you're blowing smoke. There's no such thing as real love. No one will ever care for me. You have to control and manage other people. You're trying to get me killed by opening up to other people. Friendship is fake. Families are fake. Love is fake. Then they they blow it all off completely the first few times that they hear it. So that's I'm what I'm fascinated. Used to I'm fascinated with the idea that opening yourself up creates some sort of risk. I I can't imagine. Again, I think this is because of my natural attachment style. Yeah, I can't imagine yeah. me exposing or sharing my feelings about either a relationship or a situation or how I feel about how a conversation may have gone. Mm -hmm. I just can't imagine what risk that exposes me to. Like what what risk? What is it that people are afraid of? There's they're not going to die. I mean, what, what's the deal? Ah, but their brain thinks they are. So here's the thing. Research indicates that these attachment styles are able to form in response to bad, dangerous environments. So a thousand years ago, the Danes sail up your coast. They raid your village. They burn it to the ground. They kill most of the people. You're left in the rubble watching them sail away. And you and a couple survivors are there. Nobody's going to take care of your needs. No one's going to listen to you. It's not based on compassion. It's now based on survival and how you guys fit together. So you will become approval-seeking. And, and and women do this more than men, but men do it to approval seeking of, I will do anything for you. Please just don't abandon me or you'll become avoidant of, I am going to manage everything. I'll take every resource I can get. I won't trust people, but I can trust money and resources and that's it. And I will do everything I can to survive. And that's where that builds in. But it comes from childhood, your caregivers teach you this. They teach you about your environment. If mom and dad don't mirror to you, they have mirroring neurons in the brain. If mom's not loving you and talking with you and sharing with you and making you feel like you're enough to get her attention, if she's off, she's distracted, she's on her phone, she's depressed from postpartum, she's stressed out, she's gone at work, she abandons you, she's a drunk, she's not looking at you. Your brain says, 
I'm not interesting enough. I'm not good enough. I have to become interesting. So they try to be interesting instead of forming relationships. You become dopamine based and you throw dopamine at other people trying to make them like you. These are guys who open up like I have one liners on my dates, man. I have all these things. I can play games. I'm spinning plates. I'm keeping them interested. I'm playing dread game. I'm doing all these things. It's, it's pushing buttons in other people to demand a response because you learned mom would not give you intimacy by, by looking at you. So they learn that the world is hurtful. Maybe their parents fought in front of them. Maybe mom gave them attention, but then backed off. So it was inconsistent love. There's a hormone that's very addictive called oxytocin. You're supposed to get that when you're a kid. If you get that and then it's pulled away, you become addicted to it. That might be part of the origin of anxious attachment style is chasing this drug, this oxytocin. When you have avoidant attachment style, you actually um, might run away from oxytocin because it feels vulnerable and scary. But the brain says, I'm in a bad environment. If I be open with people, they could leave me because other people will not care for my needs. I will die. I will starve to death. When you're like two years old, I'll starve to death and die if I'm open. So I can never create risk in my relationships by ever introducing friction. And I can never trust anybody else during conflict. I have to go dark and silent every time a conflict comes up and try to solve it either by people pleasing or by sneaking away and then solving it alone. That's where the risk comes from. Their brain does believe they are going to die. That's why their limbic system kicks off. And a lot of them get panic attacks when they're exposed and they have to start trying to be open to people. It's very difficult. That's why. It's interesting if you because if you look at it as objectively as possible, and I'm not objective, I have my own lens I look at life through. Of course. Either way, you're going to run the risk of people leaving you. You're going to run the risk of, sure. of people dying or not being satisfied with you or being angry with you or just screwing you over, frankly. Uh, I, I don't think one attachment style over the other is going to keep that from happening in life. Only secure attachment, only secure attachment, because securely attached, fully securely attached people will look at a situation and say, it makes no sense to destroy my relationships. They believe in the power of sustainable relationships. So they're not looking to win at your expense. They are looking to build a sustainable, long-term, mutually fulfilling relationship. They're the ones that will say, hey, you know what? This time you came out 10% ahead of me. That's no problem. Let's Next time, let's make sure I come out 10% ahead. Let's balance out. They'll be that open and clear with you. It's the wife who, instead of making you play games and guess what she wants, says, hey, babe, this is what I'd like from you. I just want your stress to go down, but this would help me. Can we do this? If you do this, I will do everything for you in your life that you want. Just please take care of these couple things. That's it. And she means it, and she follows through on it. That would be secure attachment. It's sustainable long-term relationships. Now, the research shows that only about 50% of people in America – have a secure attachment style anymore and the two pools segregate out because the people who are used to playing games and pushing buttons in a bad environment and the people who believe that the world is okay and that they're going to be able to work cooperatively with other people they don't even signal the same to each other it's like a firefly that flashes red and a firefly that flashes blue they don't even see each other's colors so you'll say i have never seen somebody who's ever been that calm and reasonable and worked with me women don't act that way right a lot of red pill guys say this women don't ever act that way the you either control them or they control you. That's this pool of people over here. When you switch to fully secure, then you have to learn to signal to securely attach people. And then you can form these relationships that are mutually fulfilling. And I that, that would be your order of man group right there. You guys come together and build these secure relationships with each other. Instead of saying, we're going to screw each other over, we're going to hurt each other. No, we will play by fair rules. It's honor-based. It is building real relationships that are sustainable. That's, that's what you have done. That's that creation. Creation. That's secure attachment. I'm taking notes here. I always By tell people means. this, this is for me just as much as it is for anybody else. <laughs> Good thing we're recording I, this, huh? <laughs> yeah. 50% actually sounds, it sounds high to me based on my yes. own interaction, but that might be because I'm seeing it again. Like you said, the, the red versus the, the blue lights flashing or whatever it might be. Yes. And the research shows it could be going up to 65% now. It, it's it's kind of headed trending upward as worse. It's getting worse. Um, I like to say that we live in the in the ruins of of a culture. We already have had our, our social collapse. I don't think we're headed for, you know, dawn of the dead or or walking dead kind of collapse. I think we've already collapsed socially and emotionally in the ways that matter. And I think that we are rebuilding from that. I think the rebuilding has already begun, but we're living in that. It, we, we are responding as if we are living in the aftermath of a Dane attack on our village. Mm. If, if, if two thirds of us, our brains are telling us we live in a bad collapsed society, then we probably are. Um, th those, those numbers are worse 
the research shows on the coast and in big urban cities, right? You go to LA, yeah, 50% is probably pretty low. Maybe it's 75% of broken attachment in LA, maybe New York City. That's why those two dating pools are a nightmare. But yes, also the segregation effect where you're going to be biased and you're going to see different groups of people. That's it's 100%. The research in the best we can guess is about 50 to 65% right now. Why do you, why is it the, the, the coastal cities or the urban environments? Does it have to do with the pace of life? Does it have to do with politics and cultural beliefs? What, what does that come from? It's about a hundred years coming right now. So a hundred years ago, we had world war one. We lost a huge chunk of men We had world war two, but between that, we had the dust bowl. We had the great depression. We had all kinds of issues. Um, most people don't realize that the middle of America was hollowed out and went like this to the two coasts. About mm -hmm. 1920, we also had the the majority of people switched from rural living into urban living, and then that got worse and worse and worse and worse. But what happened was the family bonds were ripped apart. It was called kith and kin networks, extended family networks, and even now the nuclear family was ripped apart. So you go to the major cities, and 100 years ago, the average work week was about 100 hours. Uh, mm -hmm. 100 hours, 80 to 100 hours. Henry Ford was the one who revolutionized that with 40 hour work weeks. He was actually sued by other companies because he only worked his employees 40 hours a week, then paid them as if they were working 100 hours. Then they said, the other company said, well, we can't compete with that. So they sued him to make him stop taking care of his employees. But that was 100 <laughs> years ago. Okay. And then all these men went through meat grinders and died and died and died. Either they physically died in the wars or they mentally and emotionally died. So they came home and, and, and they were broken if you look at uh the beginning of the vid the music video of twisted sister we're not gonna take it the dad is yelling and screaming at his kid you're gonna die you need to do what you're doing you need to build a skill you're gonna starve in this world it's gonna eat you alive that was the silent generation and the greatest generation raising the baby boomers who then went on and said screw everything they got cars that became mobile sex wagons they created modern dating the baby boomers very much did um they created this screw everybody and everything no response responsibility not all of them but but a significant portion of them did right now they're tripling the divorce rates in their 70s and 80s if you can still believe that they are still fighting to the death over pos possessions and divorces in their 80s I, I can't even imagine being 80 years old and trying to divorce my wife at that point that's just bonkers but they're still doing that um they obliterated, obliterated all of those networks that were protecting us, that were guiding us. And those, again, pushed more people into urban environments along the coasts because that's where the jobs are. That's where all the markets have been. That 100 years ago, they really formed up as, on the two coasts, those two centers of industry. And so we are continuing to destroy our families to move to those coastal areas. And then we move around those coastal areas and we break down our families even worse. So it's not that the ones in the middle are perfect, but the ones in the middle often have been, of America often often have better networks and better mm -hmm. connections. So someone will come in. Your mom isn't great, but your grandma is, right? Your dad isn't perfect, but you have three uncles. You have this, this cousin network. My wife, she has, uh, it's like, 51 first cousins or something uh, ridiculous, like big families in the middle of America, almost no family at all on the, on the sides of America, the big coastal urban center. So that's part of the reason you're seeing major cities as ground zero for this destruction. That's why also major cities are the big driving forces with like Tinder and just going out trying to marry strangers or sleep with strangers. You're dopamine binging on strangers because you don't have oxytocin, you don't have vasopressin, you don't have GABA, you don't have serotonin. You don't have the, the brain chemicals you're supposed to get through healthy, secure attachment. Your brain is clicked into survival mode. It actually turns off all of those other chemicals in, in some ways, floods you with cortisol, and then you become a dopamine binger. That's why we're seeing this, this rise of dopamine binging. Only fans, pornography, sugar, food addiction, uh, sex addiction with, with dating and, and just serial dating. That's why people at seven months get bored of a relationship and move on to the next one because they're not building oxytocin bonds the way they should. They're supposed to form that over the first seven months. They're flooding into dopamine instead. Then in a year, they're like, man, I'm not feeling this anymore. It's just not feeling good. I guess you're not the one for me. No, you are incapable of forming the biological bonds you were supposed to form because you're not attaching correctly. That, that, that sorry for the rant, but I mean, that's, that's how things have got so much worse over the last hundred years. And that's why the coastal cities and big urban cities are ground zero for this. I want to go to that oxytocin bonds, but before I, yeah. uh, before I get into that, the other thing that I think might have play a factor is not only the nuclear family, but I imagine it has to do with uh, organizational uh, institutions that we used to attach to, for example, church, and you see dwindling church numbers. Uh, and then I, I've been looking a little into uh, military recruiting and you see 
the bonds that are forged in the military are drastically reduced because fewer and yes. fewer men up to 75% of our youth cannot qualify physically to join the military without some sort of medical waiver. So mm -hmm. we see military uh, recruitment and numbers declining, which is where a lot of those bonds were forged as well. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's five, there's five clusters that we are supposed to rely on to build healthy, secure attachment. And, and it's like, if, if one fails, the next one catches you. If that one fails, the next one catches you. Nuclear family was number one, your nuclear mm -hmm. family, your caregivers, your siblings, your mom and dad, they were supposed to teach you love and connection that people will, will pay attention to you. Not because you're interesting, but, but because they're fascinated by you and they love you. You are enough. Mom's mirroring neurons with you back and forth. Mom pays attention to me. Mom loves me. If that doesn't work, something goes wrong with your nuclear your family you're supposed to have your extended family grandma grandpa in the old days people had five generations alive you had great 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 grandma and she was on the porch great great grandma then great grandma then grandma then mom you had all these this flood of, of people women and men who would just lavish love upon you so there was always somebody to teach you that they cared about you right we don't have that anymore either the last hundred years has, has pulled families apart and thrown them into isolated little condos and, and and little mini malls and strip malls and everything that that's what we've been pulled away from um after that is what's called the kith and kin network right extend like my third cousin my wife's fam my wife's brother you know and, and his sister-in-law and and this guy over here and, and this family that married into our family 300 years ago and now we're best friends and and these this family down the street and this family that we've been close friends with kith and kin right then after that is community it might be your village could be your tribe could be your neighborhood that the community aspect somebody there would step forward and mentor you if everything else fell through somebody would step forward and mentor you and if that fell through, you had church, you had religion, you had community, your synagogue or your, 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 your church or your mosque or whatever it was you had, that was level five. And all of those things would connect and you would build secure attachment. You would make friends. You would find your partner, your wife, you get married, you'd have babies. Everybody would know everybody. So you had everybody's data. You weren't dating, dating strangers. You weren't gambling. People would form businesses together. You knew each other. It was an honor-based society because you were pressured to act properly. Otherwise your life would be a disaster from then on because no one would trust you. Everything was built on these five networks. All five have been destroyed. We don't have any of them anymore. Mm. Yeah, what a sad state of affairs. I, and I don't see that improving anytime soon, especially as we're more connected digitally. And look, we started this by saying, you know, social media is great in a lot of ways with regards to marketing and getting a message out there and teaching yeah. millions of people something they would not have access to any other way. Right. But also it allows us to have these faux relationships that make us believe that we have 5,000 friends when we don't have a single one. It's true. It's true. I, I do. I do think that we are bringing back level four, the community. I think we're bringing back level four with digital communities, digital connections. I think level four is coming back. I've seen, I, I have my, my private network, the attachment circle, right? People come in, they're actually forming physical relationships. I've met people in there in person. I fly to their city. I see them. It's great. They meet each other. They're in the same cities. They travel, they visit. We're starting to build those back. I think level, level four is building back through digital connections, which is then building level three, kith and kin. I think we're making those happen again. Um, religion. We can't tell what's going on. Sometimes it goes up. Sometimes it goes down. The ones who are very, very um, deluded in their message where they water it down, those are dying. The ones who are core message seem to be going up across the board with all religions. It seems like the ones that are core to the message of the original religion, people are flocking into it. Young people are flocking into it. But if you water it down, you die. So five, four, and three are starting to filter back. There's people like you who are teaching, right? I was looking at your slogan just this, just this morning on Instagram, um, building father. I, I can't remember the wording, so forgive me, but masculinity, bringing back, standing between your family and danger, building that back. Now, you're not just talking about physical danger or social danger. You're also talking about their emotional and mental danger, building that back, fostering that connection. I have four children. Like I said, number five is coming. I am personally responsible for the mental health and mental outcomes and emotional health of my children. Now, my wife takes front point on a lot of that because she's their mom when they're small, but I am personally responsible for their emotion, emotional and mental well-being as well. And I track that very carefully and we make sure that they're doing well. I need to protect them in that way. That's also fatherhood in the modern era. So yes, 
I, a lot of those have been broken, but I do believe we are bringing back one and three and four and five. We're working on number two, the extended family. That'll come. I think it's coming. We're rebuilding. I hope so. That, 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 I hope that's so. the white pill here. That's the white pill here, you guys. We are rebuilding. It's just going to take some time. As you were talking about responsibility, I can't help but think that that has just that alone has a large part to play with your attachment style. Because if you're anxious, uh, you're you're taking everything on. You're not really looking at that in a healthy way. If you're avoidant, you believe that, like you said, it's everybody else's problem. But I imagine that a a responsible person, somebody who believes that they have a responsibility not just for themselves, that selfishness, but they have a responsibility for the people around them. And they have also a responsibility to make sure they're capable of protecting or providing yes. or leading other individuals. I, I imagine that's a huge part of that, that, that element of responsibility. Absolutely. And you nailed it. Anxious attachment will believe that they will inevitably fail at responsibility. So they take it on in a cluster and they become codependent trying to be useful so people won't abandon them. But then they believe ultimately it's doomed. So they end up destroying and sabotaging their own efforts. So they fail in their responsibilities. Yes, avoidant men view responsibility as a death threat, right? I have no responsibility. I raised you till you were 18. Now you're on your own. Get out. You know, I fed you. That's all I have to do is feed you and put a roof over your head. That is being a father. No, that's being a social worker. You need to do a little bit more than that to be a real father, to be honest with you. Um, to that point, I believe, and I, and I want to get your thoughts on this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because you, you have been a big masculinity teacher and a, and a man who calls men to action in a good way. And I've admired that about you for years now. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I believe that masculinity essentially died in the West. It died. Okay. And women became masculine to try to step into that role. I think that, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, women became the guardians of masculinity to create order and structure when men died or checked out largely. I think that then we had an emergence or a rising, a rebirth of masculinity, but a child version. I think it was shepherded by women in the 70s and 80s, maybe the 90s, child masculinity of, okay, mom, I'll be good. I'll be nice. I'll be happy. I'll do whatever you tell me to. I think that that rose up and we had a lot of happy wife, happy life became the message during that time. Um, I think that now we're in the middle or we're, we're maybe at the tail end of what I would call juvenile masculinity. I think the reborn masculinity has been going through its turbulent teenage years with, look at me, I can bang a pile of supermodels every night. How many Bugattis do you have? You know, I'm buff, I'm tough. Nobody tells me what to do. We're regaining personal sovereignty, which is the per first real step of masculinity. Like you said beautifully, you cannot take care of other people if you cannot master yourself, if you cannot take care of yourself. Personal sovereignty is the spring point for everything else to come after that. But I believe we are emerging into adult masculinity, mature masculinity, what I call secure masculinity. I believe we're emerging into that. I've seen Andrew Tate. I've seen video of him. People ask him, would you ever get married? And he says, you know, when I was young, I would have said no, but I'm starting to rethink my stance on that. I think I think love is worthy of taking a risk. He's, he's starting to say that, which is fascinating. Um, 12 years ago, we had a guy named Rush V, if you're familiar with him. He was in red pill circles. And he yep. was he wrote, bang this city, bang that city, how to sleep with women, how to do predatory things, basically, to get women. Um, and he disavowed his entire body of work, had a religious conversion, and now teaches men to step forward in masculinity and to embrace responsibility. He's not perfect, but I mean, we're seeing this emergence of, of this mature adult masculinity, I think, finally. Um, that is my belief. And masculinity, mature masculinity, springs from personal sovereignty that then creates the basis for responsibility. Like you said, taking care of others, drawing those bigger circles, protecting others, providing, I see a back air on your board, right? The, the right behind over your shoulder, the, the call of manhood right there. Um, that's my thought is that we are in the middle of an adult awakening of mature masculinity, drawing out from the turbulent juvenile years. What do you think of that? Am I off base or am I there? No, I think you're, I think we use slightly different terminology and, and I'll explain that in a second, but I think you're very much accurate on that. I mean, I wrote a book in 2016 called Sovereignty, the battle for the hearts and minds of men. It was all focused on taking care of yourself first so that you could effectively lead other people, not just isolate mm -hmm. uh, the terms that I use. And I think we're in alignment on this. We just use different, different words. Probably. Probably. Uh, what I believe is that masculinity is amoral. So a lot of people will say mm. masculinity is inherently good or masculinity mm. is inherently wrong. It's actually neither. It's amoral. Uh, mm. It's it's just a set of characteristics 
uh, actions, behaviors based on our biological makeup, nothing more, nothing less. So our desire to uh, be competitive, to our propensity for violence, uh, mm -hmm. dominance, aggression, stoicism, th those are amoral. You could use those to harm other individuals or you can use those to serve people. So masculinity, I think, is what you would call uh, maybe I can't remember exactly the, the immature masculine, I think juvenile. is what you may have said. Juvenile. juvenile. Masculinity, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I call that's, what you, that's the one that, that that's the one that rejects responsibility. Like you're talking about, what do you, what do you call of it? Course. Uh, what I would call somebody who has risen above that is not necessarily mature masculinity, but manliness, which I think are uh, one and the same. It's your absolutely. ability to harness those masculine characteristics for the betterment of yourself and the people around you. And once you can do that, then I believe we hear it. Even people will say it, that's a man. And yes. what they're describing is somebody who's honorable, who's using his characteristics to better other people or himself. So yes. that's, that's how I choose to look at it. I love that. I think masculinity finds its fullness in responsibility for others and over others. We might say service. I like, I like that word, but other men would balk I do at too. that and would say, and, and other men would say, you know, I'm not a slave to other people. You don't have to be. Again, personal sovereignty at all times informs everything you do because you and you must defend your personal sovereignty, whether that's against your addictions, your weakness, your fear, but also other people encroaching upon it and demanding from you. Personal sovereignty allows you to take care of others. But then we find our fullness, our fullness is in care for others. Otherwise, you're just. You're, you're just a man in the woods. His, your life is masturbation and there's no point to it, but in care for others and responsibility and crafting a legacy, that's where manhood finds itself. I love that. I like that. You're talking about service is not slavery necessarily. You, you, you can make a choice. Somebody who's enslaved cannot make a choice. They have no sovereignty, right. but somebody who's actively choosing to serve others still has a choice, whether they do it or not. You know, you look at the greatest right. example, Jesus Christ, and I know not everybody will like this, this uh, analogy here, but uh, obviously a servant leader, no one would consider him a slave. He was sovereign uh, over the world, in fact, and yet he chose to serve other people. That's the thing is in, in, in the moment of servitude, you must maintain personal sovereignty. You are choosing to serve, not because you must, but because it aligns with your purpose, with your mission, with your desire. You are choosing to serve others because it serves a greater good that you are actually in service to. You don't go to your wife and say, I am your slave. Tell me what to do. Please step on me. <laughs> right. You say, I am building a family. I'm building not just four kids and a wife. I am building a thriving legacy that will survive 300 years from now. When they have forgotten my name, they will still be honorable and caring for each other and strong, and they will make this world a better place, right? I call it the rule of three. You take you, you have three people that you mentor or train or, or, or raise, whatever it is. Three people. They have three people. That's nine. They have three people. That's 27. They have three people. That's 81. Now you're at 120. And that's just four. That's just four ripples. It goes up from there, guys. It, it, your ability to craft a legacy is so overwhelming and so easy when you have personal sovereignty and can then act in service to others but you must never allow yourself to become a slave to others there's a great movie called cool hand luke and in there he uh, he goes to jail and prison basically a work labor camp and they force him to try to break and they try to smash him down and break his spirit and I'll spoil the movie for anyone who hasn't seen it, but it's it's an ancient movie. But at the end, he he refuses so hard to become their slave. He breaks out of the camp, goes to a cabin, and gets in a shootout knowing they're going to kill him. He refuses to let them take him back and make him a slave. He lives and dies on his own terms. That is the essence of personal sovereignty. You even live and die on your own terms. You refuse to submit to slavery servitude is not slavery servitude is you building something meaningful by caring for others that's the important piece so the, the one of the interesting things that i've learned about attachment styles and and i think again nice guy syndrome is a lot of some a lot of uh, is a is a thing a lot of our listeners deal with is oh, yeah. when i learned that it's not just that you want to be nice it's that you want to manipulate other people yes. And I think a lot of nice guys 
don't even realize they're doing it, you're not being nice because that's what you want to be. You're doing it because you think you're going to get laid or you think people are going to like you or you think people are going to approve of you. And so you're not nice. You're acting that way, but you're actually just manipulating other people. And attachment, uh, secure attach, excuse me, anxious attachment and avoidant attachment is all a manipulation to get other people to do something that they don't want to inherently or, or voluntarily do themselves. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And here's, let's soften that blow just a little bit for people who are anxiously attached. Yes, all of that is true. And also people who have anxious attachment style and even avoidant attachment style, they understand pain. They don't want to inflict pain on other people. When we say manipulation, we're not saying you're trying to exploit other people. It's that they don't believe there is any way on this planet for them to get their needs met by saying, hey, Ryan, here's a need I have. Can you take care of me? Can you help me? They don't believe that that's possible. They don't believe Ryan's going to say, yeah, for the sake of our relationship, I would love to help you selflessly. I'll do that. Also, in return, could you do this for me? Yes, absolutely. Care, mutual care, non-exploitation. They don't believe that exists. Avoidant people don't believe anyone else is capable of that. Anxious people don't believe they are worthy of that. So they think if I ask Ryan, hey, Ryan, could you do this for me? You're going to go, ugh. You don't deserve that. Then you're going to get up and leave or you're going to be grudgingly fine. I'll do this for you, but I will never like you ever again. That's what they believe. So I'll do 10 nice things for you and I'll do these and and you'll do, you'll understand my needs and do this for me. There's a book. I have it on my shelf. No more Mr. Nice Guy by Dr. Robert Glover. He's been kind of like a mentor to me. He's a fantastic guy. I've spoken to him a few times. He's wonderful. Um, But in his book, he talks about secret contracts. I am doing these nice things for you. And they are secret contracts that you will be so grateful. You will rip your clothes off and have sex with me. This is guys doing chores, chore play. I'm going to do chores to get my wife to have sex with me. No, it ain't going to work that way. She doesn't, she doesn't get turned on by dishes. You are simply removing an obstacle that you can then build a relationship with her and have that sexual intercourse. That's, that's what's trying to be built there. So yes, guys who have anxious attachment, I, and I make this clear in my attachment boot camp video course that shows you how to fix attachment issues. You must start being explicit in the relationships you have in your needs. Ryan, after this episode, I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to you and I'm going to say, Hey man, is there anything I can do to help you advance anything at all that I can do in service to you? And you're going to turn around probably and say, Hey Adam, I would love to have this person on that, you know, or this person. And could you get me some people? And I'd say, yeah, absolutely. And you would say, but probably in return, Adam, is there anything I could do for you? And I'll say, "Mm, sure. Do you know some podcasts that I could be on? That's going to be us taking care of each other blatantly and openly. That's not me fishing around saying, Hey Ryan, uh, you know, is there, um, do you know any other podcasts? I'm, I'm sure, you know, other podcasts, Ryan, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, Hmm. You know, waiting for you to offer. That's not going to be me doing that. That's effeminate. Uh, Just me doing that was effeminate. You and I are going to be clear and direct after this. That's the goal. You guys is not to get secure and just sit there. Oh, I'm secure. It's to begin having direct relationships and direct sharing of needs and secure relationships like Brian and I are building already. (laughs) That's the we, uh, we all know that person too. It's that person who you haven't heard from for a few years or a few months. And all of a sudden they reach out and they're like, Hey, I'm just checking in. And you get in a conversation with them uh-huh. and then five texts down the road or 20 minutes into the phone call finally comes the ask of like, Hey, by the way, yeah. you know, we all can see right through it and we all do it. I think the biggest thing that I've personally have been working on is making sure in your example, if I'm offering other podcasts for you to join, it comes with no strings attached. Yeah, I think that's how you know, at least that's how I've known that I'm doing this with the right intention, which is to be yes. a value, which is to serve you because I care about you to a degree. Uh, yeah. and, and I want to offer my network to you with no anticipation or expectation of anything in return. But what's Correct. ironic about it is the individuals who give without any expectation, whether it's platonic or even romantic, are the ones who get in return. Yes, you form reciprocal care. It's it's not the secure attachment is martyrdom and you are just endlessly bleeding yourself out to other people. That That's, that's anxious attachment. It's, hey, I'm going to give value, understanding that some some will just drop off and it'll just go okay that's fine drops drops of water in the desert that's totally fine but there will also be people who will nurture me in return and i'm not giving to get them 
but I am anticipating some of that and I'll be grateful when it happens and I won't try to exploit them. My goal is to over give to them, right? There, there's a fantastic book, um, a little bit off topic, but I love this book. It's called what rich clients want um, by the, the man who started a, a travel company called Fortis. Um, I believe it's Fortis and a great chauffeur company. And in his book, he talks about, look, people think that wealthy individuals at the top are the stingiest, meanest, scroogiest kind of people on earth. And in fact, they're not. In fact, they are the most generous people because they give value. If you give selflessly to them, they say, I want you in my life forever. Here's a Rolex. Here's this for your kids. What are your kids like? Let me buy those things for them. Let me keep you around by giving you value because you make my life so much better. Please let me serve you in return. And that's that's been true. The wealthiest individuals I've ever met are the most generous who give value without even asking anything in return. They don't hand you something and ask you for something. They give for the joy of giving to you. And they know that people will return, good people will return that to them in time. That's reciprocal care. That's secure attachment. That's exactly what you and I are going to build. And everybody at home, that's what you should be building in your families. Yeah, that's powerful. Uh, let, let's go back to the conversation about oxytocin bonds. Y yes. You said that uh, you were talking about the guy, for example, who dates somebody for seven months and realizes, oh, maybe she's not the one because they don't properly bond. What what is what does properly bonding look like relative mm. to an, an unhealthy way of doing it, which is what you see so much on dating apps and modern dating? I love this, I love this question. Thank you so much for asking this. Yes, um, healthy, secure bonding. You get into the conversations within the first couple conversations, the first couple dates, you make it clear what you're looking for. Something along these lines. Hey, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. I'm looking for a long-term committed relationship. We don't have to get married tomorrow, but I'm looking for that. I'm looking for a family and I'm looking for a connection. Is that what you want to down the road? If we turn out to be right for each other, is that what we're both building for? If so, awesome. If not, hey, we'll finish our dinner. We'll high five. We'll go different ways. Just let me know what you're looking for. Next couple of dates. Hey, share stories about our values. You actually start talking about values, your desires, your beliefs, your religious beliefs, your thoughts, your 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 wants for life. You start sharing those, but storytelling, right? And you start showing each other how do you live with conflict? How, what are you overcoming? Can you respect and admire each other? Substance, right? Early dating is substantial instead of fluff. And then third date or fourth date, somewhere in there, you go in for the ask. Hey, I really like you. I admire you. You are the kind of person I'm looking for. What do you need to make this a, a, an official relationship? Can we go exclusive? I really am looking to make this something with you. It, it works like this. Guys hear this and they say, no woman would ever want that. Women hear this and say, no man would ever want that. Both sides are craving this and both sides mm. are afraid to do this. Substance. And then... Your relationship begins on, on steady footing because you've talked about substance. Now you share things with each other and you have experiences together. You go through hardship together. You achieve things together. You even have conflict. And then you you talk and cooperate through the conflict. Hey, we could fight about this, but why don't we we reason through it? Why don't you share your, your side with me and I'll share mine with you? And people are blown away. There's people who do that. Yes, there's men and women both who do that and you share and you work on conflict and you work as a team and it feels like co-founding a business together with a successful smart co-founder who wants you to succeed that's what a good relationship feels like and you start to your, your cortisol levels go way down and your stress goes down cortisol blocks the production and reception of oxytocin now oxytocin is a warm feeling that i am accepted i am loved and you start to desire to be in that person's presence more more, and it creates spontaneous affection. This is where men become romantic. This is where men want to cuddle. This is where men want to hold her and feel and make her feel safe. It, it, this is what men fake when they're trying to manipulate a woman. They fake this, but when it's authentic, you feel it swell up from within you. They've done tests where they have fathers come in with a newborn and they have they measure the spontaneous affection. Is he playing with the child, kissing the child, touching the child, talking to the child? They measure this. And then they do shots of pure oxytocin up the nose for the fathers. And then they measure the spontaneous affection afterward. 
and they show across the board, boom, huge spike in spontaneous affection after a blast of oxytocin. Fathers are way more engaged with the babies. It's just an overabundance. You should be developing this. We, we on TikTok, they talk about feminine energy. Feminine energy is about expressing oxytocin and inspiring oxytocin in others, giving it to them so they feel loved and then nurturing it so that they then return love to others and give love. That's the power of women. And that's one reason women are, are masculine now. So men aren't getting that mostly, but we need that. That's the feminine is the ability to craft that. That is oxytocin. And you should grow that so that at seven months or a year, you are in some ways addicted to each other, but in a loving, intimate way through substance and reason and trust, you have formed an emotional bond together that brings you tighter. That's what it should feel like. And when you are not capable of that, when you are holding back, no substance in dating, no truth, hiding yourself, making yourself look good, and you're giving them dopamine. I have to be interesting. I have to be interesting. I have to be interesting. I have to keep your interest. I have to be amazing at sex. That's the only thing you care about. I have to be great at sex. I have to be hot. I have to be fit. I have to be rich, whatever it is. You are only dopamine binging, dopamine, 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 dopamine. And then at seven months, dopamine novelty wears off because it's not the new new person anymore. And it's exhausting to maintain. So at seven months, you say, this doesn't feel right. At a year, you say, this is awful. You're cruising for the next person. You're flipping through. You're watching porn. You're cheating on the other person. You're, 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 you're bailing out. You're on Tinder looking for the next match. That's the process. When you fix attachment, you bond properly. Hmm. That's so powerful. I, you know, as you were saying that I was thinking about guys that I've heard who, uh, are, are on the dating scene and single and, and they're saying, you know, I, I would like a feminine woman. And, and you hear that like, oh, there's no feminine women. They're all masculine, which I think is increasingly true, not exclusively true, but increasingly true. Hmm. But I, I think the key here is, well, if you want a feminine woman, then you've got to be a masculine man. Cause if you're feminine, She's got to be masculine. If you're masculine, it gives her the opportunity and space to be feminine and to soften up, which is what I think most men are after. Correct. Femininity is a well of water, an endless well of water. The water is life. It's oxytocin. It's love. It's nurturing. It's feeding, right? The well is water. A well that's sitting in the middle of nowhere. Number one, people pull up and just take stuff from it all the time. You pull up, a water truck pulls up, throws the hose down there, starts draining it dry, pulls off, it goes to give the water to other people. Stuff falls in it, right? There's crap falling in the well all the time. A well needs safety, a structure to protect the wall from things falling in it, to protect the well, and it needs a gate around it to protect who gets to come in and who gets access right? Masculinity is the protection and it's the access, right? It's a wall and a roof. It's a home. It's a house built around the well of femininity. I'm not saying femininity is the point and masculinity is just there to make take, take care of it. But from a societal standpoint, from a legacy standpoint, from a human survival standpoint, masculinity provides shelter and structure and safety so that femininity can then bring life from within. That is the purpose. And if, if, if it's just a well in the middle of nowhere, women become masculine to protect themselves against you. If you are masculine, she can become feminine. It must be in that order. Yeah, that's I've I've heard of it. The analogy I've heard is a bowl, but I really like that well better. That 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 to me is a little bit more visual to see what you actually should be doing. And and I've seen it, and other and other men have seen it. Uh, oh, yeah. And but the other thing too is that you can't just erect the walls and the and the gate and the and the fence and all of that, and then just leave it alone. You know, I think that's a mistake a lot of us fall into as well. Is think because we did the work initially that it's all fine. That thing must be maintained as well. And that's mm -hmm. something that we need to continue to do as men mm -hmm. if we want mm -hmm. the relationships that we desire. Absolutely. Absolutely. As the man, you are nurturing that well. You are keeping it alive, right? Anyone who has a well knows that you also have to protect the drainage fields. You have to make sure the rainfall is falling in the right way and it's refilling the underground reservoirs that then fill the well. You are caring for the land around the well. You are maintaining this well that brings life for you. That is also the role of a man is to protect the well and maintain the well at the same time. That's the role of a man. That's the role of a father, a husband. That's our duty, right? In the Bible, it talks about the man must cherish and protect and honor. You are nurturing this well that life comes through. That's your job. Take it seriously. Yeah.
How do you suggest a guy who's maybe in a long-term relationship, 10 plus years with, with his wife and, you know, the kids are getting older and uh, maybe some of the, the uh, romanticism is, is gone from the relationship, but he feels like he really wants to build this relationship up to where it once was. Where does a guy like that start? Uh, and, and what does that look like? Mm. Number one, do not look to women to solve your problems. Number one, get around other men who have happy marriages and start collecting that solution network from them, right? Link up your one little data node blinking in the middle of nowhere saying, how, how do I have a happy marriage? Link up to data nodes that have happy marriages. Number one, because those guys will kick your butt if you ruin your marriage. <laughs> they'll yell at you and they'll, and they'll make you do it. So number one, there's that and you get information from them. Number two, two different bonding hormones, right? Oxytocin bonding. If she's just, if it's just cool, a cool marriage, not a cold marriage, but it's just not warm, your roommates, then start with oxytocin bonding. Her emotional intimacy is the measurement of if you care for her. She, you cannot just grab her butt and start trying to go to town. You have to warm the engine up by showing her that you love her, by showing her she is more than a body to you. Build oxytocin through emotional intimacy. It's, it's ongoing, right? Ongoing connections, ongoing bonds, ongoing non-sexual physical contact. This is one of the number one things I teach couples who come into my coaching is how to foster emotional intimacy together. You've got to fix that. And it often dies with attachment issues. So if you've had attachment issues, that might be part of your problem. Number one, build the emotional intimacy. And then number two, this is really important. The research shows that the healthiest, long-lasting marriages that experience multiple honeymoon events throughout the course of marriage are those that have vasopressin bonding renewed every so often. So you must face challenges with your wife. Women complain that marriages feel stale when they sense the vasopressin bonding is weak. They don't have the word vasopressin, most of them, but they will say it feels like we're stuck in a rut. Men love vasopressin bonding. You go out to a new restaurant and try it together. Introduce a tiny amount of stress and then overcome it together through an experience. Jigsaw mm. puzzles are a tiny amount of vasopressin that you, you solve the little puzzles together. Fix up a car, repaint your house, repair something, pay off a debt, learn a skill together, take a dancing class, take a cooking class, solve something together together vasopressin bond by saying look we are one hell of a team every time my wife and i achieve something together we literally high five and yell vasopressin because it's an acknowledgement that we did something together as a team not i did it and she followed along not she did it and i was just there we did this as a team and we vasopressin bond and when you do that both of your brains say I want this person around all the time. And it instigates oxytocin bonding, which brings a new honeymoon phase. That's what people mess up all the time. Oh, yeah, there's a tiny honeymoon phase and then you'll never be passionate again. No, renew the vasopressin bonding and you renew that phase over and over and over and over. That's what you're missing. So give her emotional intimacy and also do vasopressin bonding. Solve challenges together. Do both. That The fire will be burning hotter than you've ever seen it. So oxytocin, that would be more of the, the emotional feelings mm -hmm. aspect of it. And then the vasopressin mm -hmm. is actually working through solving yes. problems and the practical application of teamwork together. Yes. Oxytocin refills her well so that she has a water to give you sexually and lovingly. And vasopressin reminds your brain that she is an ally and is priority and makes you prioritize her. So then you desire more oxytocin. You're not just saying, okay, I'll go through the bond. I'll go through the checklist. I'll make you feel good. You say, no, I want to give you oxytocin, babe. I want us to have a great time. These are the guys that they jump in the bedroom and say, all right, you're getting 20 of them tonight. She's like, please, no, I want to live, right? These are the guys jumping in, trying to do that bonding. That's actually him vasopressin bonding. Hey, babe, we're going to hit 20 tonight. It's a challenge. Let's do it. He's trying to vasopressin bond with her. And she's like, why are you doing this? I just want to have a shared experience, oxytocin. But if you guys do that together, then hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful. Well, I know you have courses and programs and you talked a little bit mm -hmm. about uh, what, what was your program called? Attachment Circle. Um, and then you talked about your boot camp briefly. Will you, as we wind things down today, share a little bit more about how to connect with you, 
uh, what oh, programs you have available and let the guys know where to, to find what you're up to. Oh, absolutely. Number one place to start is my website, adamlanesmith.com. I have to be Adam Lane Smith. You can't be Adam Smith, the old Scottish economer, because it's 3,000 right. books on Amazon alone about him. Adamlanesmith.com. <laughs> on there, you will find my personal coaching where I train men through this. I help couples reignite that spark. I help people fix their attachments so they can be the man that they are meant to be instead of being insecure and lonely. I also have the attachment bootcamp video course on there that streamlines the attachment fixing process in 10 clear steps. Check that out. And I also have the attachment circle, a private gated digital community where I do group coaching events in there. And I teach endlessly about relationship skills and all of finding this balance in your relationships. AdamLaneSmith.com. Check it out. Yeah. Well, I know what you're doing is powerful. I've, I've taken some of your advice and implemented it for the betterment of, of my life. Oh. Again, from a friendship perspective, a business perspective, and also a romantic perspective. So, man, I appreciate you joining us today. There's so much more we can talk about, but guys, you know where to go. Um, Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an honor. Thank you for having me here.